welcome. Welcome to um, um, to my living room. <laughs> uh, um, it used to belong to Simon No Chenema, but um, uh, as you can see, uh, I have um, uh, taken over. Hello, uh, uh, alas. Mm, yes, kind of groovy music. <laughs> Uh, well, you see, um, uh, you see, uh, my name is down there. I am a cat, and um, and the reason uh, uh, I have taken over is because today we're going to be having a story, and I shall be um, reading the story, and um, uh, I shall be doing it by way of Kamishibai, like I did a couple of weeks ago. And um, and uh, uh, if you're wondering um, where where this Simon chap is, uh, well, let's let's just um, let's, uh, he's, he's he's over here next to me. <laughs> Simon the cat, yes. <clears throat> there we are. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> so, so I've made my guest appearance. I've made my guest appearance. <laughs> and uh, I may reappear at, at certain point. Uh, but for now, uh, let's get back uh, to the question in hand. The question in hand is a story. And the story is, I am a cat. And uh, it was written uh, more than 100 years ago. Um, by a certain gentleman by the name of uh, Natsume uh, Soseki. I shall sure, sure just um, show you him. Uh, this is the chap, uh, famous Japanese author. Um, and he wrote it uh, at a meeting, or, or for a meeting, of literary friends uh, for the literary magazine Hotogitsu, it was called. And uh, they all gathered there in, in uh, Soseki's house, uh, in his living room. In his living room, yes. <laughs> and uh, they all read stories uh, that they'd written. Uh, and the editor of the magazine was also there. And uh, he would then decide which stories would uh, would be good enough uh, to go into the that month, edi month edition of the uh, uh, of the magazine. And uh, naturally, uh, the story of I Am A Cat um, by Soseki uh, was loved by all. Uh, they all laughed at it, uh, at its witty poke, at uh, the changes in Japanese society uh, brought about by the introduction of Western uh, principles and ideas, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, so it did. It did end up uh, in the said magazine. And it was so popular that uh, he was uh, asked to write more. And he did. And eventually uh, he produced uh, 10, 10 um, st separate stories, which were then all eventually combined into one book published in 1911. Uh, I shall not be reading the entire book. Um, that would take far too long, far, far, far too long. <laughs> uh, but I shall be right, reading um, uh, the, possibly what, what, appeared to be, uh, what appears to be the first instalment. Um, so... Uh, if you're all sitting comfortably, uh, all one of you, uh, alas, <laughs> um, perhaps, perhaps I should begin. Um, oh, somebody else has joined. Jolly good. <laughs> uh, it's, oh, it's always better to, to, to re read to more people than one. Uh, well, not that you're... I, 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 I'm getting myself into problems here. I should just go to the Kamishibai and we shall begin the story. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> Uh, I have to, uh, yes, you're sitting comfortably, uh, then I shall start there. There we go. There's the, the, the title screen. I am a cat by Natsumi Soseki, as told by Simon No Chanama. So let's, uh, I better call the, the, um, the old story up, actually. So, uh, I am a cat. As yet, I have no name. I have no idea where I was born. All I remember is that I was meowing in a dampish, dark place when, for the first time, I saw a human being. This human being, I heard afterwards, was a member of the most ferocious human species, a chaussée, one of those students who, in return for board and lodging, perform small chores about the house. I hear that, on occasion, this species catches, boils, and eats us. However, as at that time I lacked all knowledge of such creatures, I did not feel particularly frightened. I simply felt myself floating in the air as I was lifted up lightly on his palm. When I accustomed myself to that position, I looked at his face. This must have been the very first time that I ever set eyes on a human being. The impression of oddity which I then received still remains today. First of all, the face that should be decorated with hair is as bald as a kettle. 
since that day, I have never met many, I've met many a cat, but never have I come across such deformity. The centre of the face protrudes excessively, and sometimes, from the holes in that protuberance, smoke comes out in little puffs. I was originally somewhat troubled by such exhalations, for they made me choke, but I learned only recently that it was the smoke of burnt tobacco which humans like to breathe. For a little while I sat comfortably in that creature's palm, but things soon developed at a tremendous speed. I could tell, I could not tell whether the chaussée was in movement, or whether it was only I that moved. But anyway, I began to grow quite giddy, to feel sick, and just as I was thinking that the giddiness would kill me, I heard a thud and saw a million stars. Thus far I can remember, but however hard I try, I cannot recollect anything thereafter. When I came to myself, the creature had gone. I had at one time a basket full of brothers, but now not one could be seen. Even my precious mother had disappeared. Moreover, I now found myself in a painfully bright place, most unlike that nook where I had once sheltered. It was in fact so bright that I could hardly keep my eyes open. Sure that there was something wrong, I began to crawl about, which proved painful. I had been snatched away from the softest straw, only to be pitched with violence into a prickly clump of bamboo grass. After a struggle, I managed to scramble clear of the clump and emerged to find a wide pond stretching beyond it. I sat at the edge of the pond and wondered what to do. No helpful thought occurred. After a while, it struck me that, if I cried, perhaps the chaussée might come back and fetch me. I tried some feeble mewing, but no one came. Soon a light wind blew across the pond, and it began to grow dark. I felt extremely hungry. I wanted to cry, but I was too weak to do so. There was nothing to be done. However, having decided that I simply must find food, I turned very, very slowly, left round the pond. It was extremely painful going. Nevertheless, I persevered and crawled on somehow until at long last I reached a place where my nose picked up some trace of human presence. I slipped into a property through a gap in the broken bamboo fence, thinking that something might turn up once I got inside. It was sheer chance if the bamboo fence had not been broken, just at that point I might have starved to death at the roadside. I realise now how true to the adage it is that what was will be will be. To this very day, that gap has served as my shortcut to the neighbour's tortoiseshell. Well, though I had managed to creep into the property, I had no idea what to do next. Soon, it got really dark. I was hungry, it was cold, and rain began to fall. I could not afford to lose any more time. I had no choice but to struggle toward a, a place which seemed brighter, warmer. I did not know it then, but I was in fact already inside the house, where I now had a chance to observe further specimens of humankind. The first one that I met was Osan, the servant woman, one of a species yet more savage than the Shosei. No sooner had she seen me than she grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and flung me out of the house. Accepting that I had no hope, I lay alone, still, with my eyes shut tight and trusting to Providence but the hunger and the cold were more than I could bear. Seizing a moment when Osan had relaxed her watch, I crawled up once again to flop into the kitchen. I was soon flung out again. I crawled up yet again, only to be flung out yet again. I remember that the process was several times repeated. Ever since that time, I have been utterly disgusted with this Osan person. The other day, I managed at long last to rid myself of my sense of grievance, for I squared accounts by stealing her dinner of mackerel pike. As I was about to be flung out for the last time, the master of the house appeared, complaining of the noise and demanding an explanation. The servant lifted me up, turned my face to the master and said, This little stray kitten has been a nuisance. I keep putting it out and it keeps crawling back into the kitchen. The master briefly studied my face, twisting the black hairs under his nos nostrils. Then, in that case, let it stay, he said, and turned and went inside. The master seemed to be a person of few words. The servant resentfully, resentfully threw me down in the kitchen, 
and it was thus that I came to make this house my dwelling. My master seldom comes face to face with me. I hear he is a school teacher. As soon as he comes home from school, he shuts himself up in the study for the rest of the day, and seldom emerges. The others in the house think that he is terribly hard working. He himself pretends to be hard working, but actually he works less hard than any of them think. Sometimes I tiptoe to his study for a peep and find him taking a snooze. Occasionally his mouth is drooling onto some book. He has a weak stomach and his skin is of a pale yellowish colour, inelastic and lacking in vitality. Nevertheless, he is an enormous gormandizer. After eating a great deal, he takes some tacadere stays for his stomach, and after that, he opens a book. When he has read a few pages, he becomes sleepy. He drools onto the book. This is the routine religiously observed each evening. There are times when even I, a mere cat, can put two thoughts together. Teachers have it easy. If you are born a human, it's best to become a teacher, for it's possible to sleep this much for if it's possible to sleep this much and still to be a teacher, why, even a cat could teach. However, according to the master, there's nothing harder than a teacher's life, and every time his friends come round to see him, he grumbles on and on. During my early days in the house, I was terribly unpopular with everyone, except the master. Everywhere I was unwelcome, and no one would have anything to do with me. The fact that nobody even to this day has given me a name indicates quite clearly how very little they have thought about me. Resigned, I try to spend as much of my time as possible with the master, the man who had taken me in. In the morning, while he reads the newspaper, I jump to curl up on his knees. Throughout the afternoon siesta, I sit upon his back. This is not because I have any particular fondness for the master, but because I have no other choice, no one else to turn to. Additionally, and in the light of other experiments, I have decided to sleep on the boiled rice container, which stays warm through the morning, on the quilted foot warmer during the evening, and out on the veranda when it is fine. But what I find especially agreeable is to creep into the children's bed and snuggle down between them. There are two children, one of five and one of three. They sleep in their own room, sharing a bed. I can always find a space between their bodies, and I can manage somehow to squeeze myself quick, quietly in. But, if by great ill luck one of the children wakes, then I'm in trouble, for the children have nasty natures, especially the younger one. They start to cry out noisily, regardless of the time, even in the middle of the night, shouting, Here's the cat! The invariably new motic... The invariably neurotic dyspeptic in the next room wakes up and comes rushing in. Why, only the other day, my master beat my backside black and blue with a wooden ruler. Living as I do with human beings, the more that I observe them, the more I am forced to conclude that they are selfish, especially those children. I find my bedmates utterly unspeakable. When the fancy takes them, they hang me upside down, they stuff my face into a paper bag, they fling me about, they ram me into the kitchen range... Furthermore, if I do com commit so much as the smallest mischief, the entire household unites to chase me around and persecute me. The other day, when I happened to be sharpening my claws on some straw floor matting, the mistress of the house became so unreasonably incensed that now it is only with the greatest reluctance that she'll even let me enter a matted room. Though I'm shivering on the wooden floor in the kitchen, heartlessly, she remains indifferent. Miss Blanche, the white cat who lives opposite, and whom which I very much admire, tells me whenever I see her that there is no living creature quite so heartless as a human. The other day she gave birth to four beautiful kittens, but three days later the chaussée of her house removed all four and tossed them away into the backyard pond. Miss Blanche, having given through her tears a complete account of this event, assured me that to maintain our parental love and to enjoy our beautiful family life, we, the cat race, must engage in total war upon all humans. We have no choice but to exterminate them. I think it is a very reasonable proposition, 
and the three-coloured tomcat living next door is especially indignant that human beings do not understand the nature of proprietary rights. Among our kind, it is taken for granted that he who first finds something, be it the head of a dried sardine or a great mullet's navel, acquires thereby the right to eat it. And if this rule be flouted, one may well resort to violence. But human beings do not seem to understand the rights of property. Every time we come on something good to eat, invariably they descend and take it from us, relying on their naked strength, and they coolly rob us of things which are rightly ours to eat. Miss Blanche lives in the house of a military man, and the Tomcat's master is a lawyer. But since I live in a, a teacher's house, I take matters of this sort rather more lightly than they. I feel that life is not unreasonable, so long as one can scrape along from day to day for surely even human beings will not flourish forever. I think it is best to wait in patience for the day of the cats. Talking of selfishness reminds me that my master once made a fool of himself by reason of his failing. I'll tell you all about it. First, you must understand that the master of mine lacks the talent to be more than an average at anything, but nonetheless he can't refrain from trying his hand at everything and anything. He's always writing haiku and submitting them to cuckoo. He sends off new style poetry to Morning Star. He has a shot at English prose peppered with gross mistakes. He develops a passion for archery. He takes lessons in chanting no playtex, and sometimes he devotes himself to making hideous noises with a violin. But I am sorry to say that none of these activities has led to anything whatsoever. Yet, though he is dyspeptic, he gets terribly keen once he has embarked upon a project. He once got him, himself nicknamed the Maestro of the Water Closet through chanting in the lavatory, but he remains entirely unconcerned and can still be heard there chanting, I'm Tyro Nomon Munamori. We all say, there goes Munamori, and titter at his antics. I do not know why it happened, but one day, a payday roughly four weeks after I'd taken up residence, this master of mine came hurrying home with a large parcel under his arm. I wondered what he'd bought. It turned out that he'd purchased watercolour paints and brushes and some special Watman paper. It looked to me as if haiku writing and medieval chanting were going to be abandoned in favour of watercolour painting. Sure enough, from the next day on and every day for some long time, he did nothing but paint pictures in his study. Oh. <laughs> I have to pause there. I, I, I appear to have um, interrupted the flow and can't f find the correct photograph. Bear with me. I think this is the one. Yes, there he is, painting in his study. He even went without his afternoon siestas. However, no one could tell what he had painted by looking at the result. Possibly he himself thought this thought little of his work. For one day, when his friend who specialises in matters of aesthetics came to visit him, I heard the following conversation. Do you know it's quite difficult? When one sees someone else painting, it looks easy enough. But not till one takes a brush oneself does one realise just how difficult it is. So said my noble master, and it was true enough. His friend, looking at my master over his gold rimmed spectacles, observed, It's only natural that one cannot paint particularly well at the moment one starts. Besides, one cannot paint a picture indoors by force of the imagination only. The Italian master, Andrea del Sarto, remarked that if you want to paint a picture, always depict nature as she is. In the sky there are stars, on the earth there are sparkling dews, birds are flying, animals are running. In a pond there are goldfish, on an old tree one sees winter crows. Nature herself is one vast living picture. Do you understand? If you want to paint a picturesque picture, why not try some preliminary sketching? Oh, so Andrea del Sarto said that. I, I didn't know that at all. Uh, come to think of it, it's quite true. Indeed, it, it, it's very true. The master was unduly impressed. I saw a mocking smile behind the gold-rimmed glasses. The next day, when, as always, I was having a pleasant nap on the veranda, the master emerged from his study, an act unusual in itself and began behind my back to busy himself with something. At this point, I happened to wake up, and wondering what he was up to, 
opened my eyes just one slit the tenth of an inch. And there he was, fairly killing himself at being Andrea del Sarto. I could not help but laugh. He's starting to sketch me, just because he's had his leg pulled by a friend. I have already slept enough, and I'm itching to yawn. But seeing my master sketching me so earnestly, I hadn't the heart to move, so I bore it with all resignation. Having drawn my outline, he started painting the face. I confess that considering cats are as works of art, I am far from being a collector's piece. I certainly do not think my figure, my fur, or my features are superior to those of other cats. But however ugly I may be, there's no conceivable resemblance between myself and that queer thing which my master is creating. First of all, the colouring is wrong. My fur, like that of a Persian, bears tortoiseshell markings on a ground of yellowish pale grey. It is a fact beyond all argument. Yet the colour which my master has employed is neither yellow nor black, neither grey nor brown, nor is it any mixture of those four distinctive colours. All one can say is that the colour used is a sort of colour. Furthermore, and very oddly, my face lacks eyes. That lack might be explained on the, on the grounds that the sketch is a sketch of a sleeping cat. But all the same, since one cannot find even a hint of an eye's location, it's not all clear whether the sketch is of a sleeping cat or of a blind cat. Secretly, I thought to myself that this would never do, even for Andrea del Sarto. However, I could not help being struck with admiration for my master's grim determination. Had it been solely up to me, I would gladly have maintained my pose for him. But nature has now been calling for some time. The muscles in my body are getting pins and needles. When the tingling reached a point where I couldn't stand it in another minute, I was obliged to, obliged to climb my, claim my liberty. I stretched my front paws far out in front of me, pushed my neck out low, and yawned cavernously. <sighs> Having done all that, no further point in trying to stay still. My master's sketch is spoilt anyway, so I might as well pad round to the backyard and do my business. Moved by these thoughts, I started to crawl sluggishly away. Immediately, you fool! came shouted in my master's voice, a mixture of wrath and disappointment, out of the inner room. He has a fixed habit of saying, you fool, whenever he curses anyone. He cannot help it, since he knows no other swear words but I thought it rather impertinent of him, thus unjustifiably to call me a fool. After all, I had been very patient up to this point. Of course, it had been his custom to show even the smallest pleasure whenever I jump on his back. Had it been the custom to show even the smallest pleasure whenever I jump on his back, I would have tamely endured his imprecations. But it is a bit thick to be called a fool by someone who has never once with good grace done me a kindness just because I get up to go and urinate. The prime fact is that all humans are puffed up by their extreme self-satisfaction with their own brute power. Unless some creatures more powerful than the humans arrive on earth to bully them, there's just no knowing to what dire lengths their fool presumptuousness will eventually carry them. One could put up with this degree of selfishness, but I once heard a report concerning the unworthiness of humans, which is several times more ugly and deplorable. At the back of my house, there is a small tea plantation perhaps some six or seven square yards. Though certainly not large, it is a neat and pleasantly sunny spot. It is my custom to go there whenever my, my morale needs strengthening. When, for instance, the children are making so much noise that I cannot doze in peace, or when boredom has disrupted my digestion. One day, a day of Indian summer, at about two o'clock in the afternoon, I woke up from a pleasant after-luncheon nap and strolled out to this tea plantation by way of taking exercise. Sniffing, one after another, at the roots of the tea plants, I came to the cypress fence at the western end. And there I saw an enormous cat fast asleep on a bed of withered chrysanthemums, which his weight had flattened down. He did not seem to notice my approach. Perhaps he noticed, but did not care. Anyway, there he was, stretched out at full length and snoring loudly. I was amazed at the daring courage that permitted him, a trespasser, to sleep so unconcernedly in someone else's garden. He was a pure black cat. The sun of earliest afternoon was pouring its most brilliant rays upon him, and it seemed as if invisible flames were blazing out from his glossy fur. 
He had a magnificent physique, the physique, one might say, of the Emperor of Catdom. He was easily twice my size. Filled with admiration and curiosity, I quite forgot myself. I stood stock still, entranced, all eyes in front of him. The quiet zephyrs of that Indian summer set gently nodding a branch of Sultana parasol which showed above the cypress fence, then a few leaves patterned down upon the couch of crushed chrysanthemums. The emperor suddenly opened his huge round eyes. I remember that moment to this day. His eyes gleamed far more beautifully than that dull amber stuff which humans so inordinately value. He lay dead still focusing the piercing light that shone from his eyes interior upon my dwarfish forehead, he remarked, "'And who the hell are you?' I thought his turn of phrase a shade inelegant for an emperor, but because the voice was deep and filled with power that could suppress a bulldog, I remained dumbstruck and with pure awe. Reflecting, however, that I might get into trouble if I failed to exchange civilities, I answered frigidly, with a false sang-froid as cold as I could make it, "'I, sir, am a cat.' I have as yet no name. My heart at that moment was beating a great deal faster than usual. In a tone of enormous scorn, the emperor observed, You, a cat? Well, I'm damned. Anyway, where the devil do you hang out? I thought this, I thought this cat excessively blunt-spoken. I, I live here in the teacher's house. Huh, well, I thought as much. Horrible scrawny, aren't you? He spoke with great vehemence. Judged by his manner of speech, he could not be a cat of respectable background. On the other hand, he seemed well-fed and positively prosperous, almost obese in his oily glossiness. I had to ask him, and who on earth are you? Me? Oh, I'm Rickshaw Blackie. He gave his answer with spirit and some pride, for Rickshaw Blackie is well known in the neighbourhood as a real tough customer. As one would expect of those brought up in a rickshaw garage, he's tough, but quite uneducated. Hence, very few as mix with him, and it is our common policy to keep him at a respectful distance. Consequently, when I heard his name, I felt a trifle jittery and uneasy, but at the same time a little disdainful of him. Accordingly, and in order to establish just how illiterate he was, I pursued the conversation by inquiring, Who do you think is superior, a rickshaw owner or a teacher? Well, a rickshaw owner, of course. He's the stronger. Just look at your master. Almost skin and bones. You being the cat of a rickshaw owner naturally look very tough. I can see that one eats well at your establishment. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I never want for decent grab wherever I go. You too, instead of creeping around in a teak plantation, why not follow along with me? Within a month, you get so fat, nobody recognise you. In due course, I might come and ask you to join me but it seems the teacher's house is larger than your boss's. You dimwit, a house, however big it is, won't help fill your empty belly. He looked quite huffed, savagely twitching his ears, ears as sharp as slant-sliced stems on the solid bamboo. He took off rowdily. This was how I first made the acquaintance of Rickshaw Blackie, and since that day I've run across him many times. Whenever we meet, he talks big, as might be expected from a rickshaw owner's cat, but that deplorable incident which I mentioned earlier was a tale he told me. One day Blackie and I were lying as usual, sunning ourselves in the tea garden. We were chatting about this and that, when having made his usual boasts as if they were all brand new, he asked me, How many rats have you caught so far? While I flatter myself that my general knowledge is wider and deeper than Blackie's, I readily admit that with my physical strength and courage are nothing compared with his, all the same, his point-blank question naturally left me feeling a bit uh, confused. Nevertheless, a fact is a fact, and one should face the truth. So I answered, Actually, though I'm always thinking of catching one, I've never caught any yet. Blackie laughed immoderately, quivering the long whiskers which struck out stiffly from his muzzle. Blackie, like all true braggarts, is somewhat weak in the head. As long as you purr and listen attentively, pretending to be impressed by his... He's Romontande, he is more or less manageable cat. Soon after getting to know him, I learnt this way to handle him. Consequently, on this particular occasion, I also thought it would be unwise to further weaken my position by trying to defend myself, and that it would be much more prudent to dodge the issue by inducing him to brag about his own successes. 
So without making a fuss, I sought to lead him on by saying, You, judging from your age, must have caught a notable number of rats. Sure enough, he swallowed the bait with gusto. Well, not too many, but I must have caught thirty or forty, was his triumphant answer. I can cope with a rat, he went on, with a hundred or two hundred at any time, and by myself. But a weasel, no, that I just can't take. Once I had a hellish time with the weasel. Did you really? I innocently offered. Blackie blinked his saucer eyes, but did not discontinue. It was last year, the day before the general house cleaning. As my master was crawling in under the floorboards with a bag of lime, suddenly a great dirty weasel came whizzing out. I make myself look impressed. I say to myself, so what's a weasel? Only a wee bit bigger than a rat. So I could chase after it, feeling quite excited, and finally I got it cornered in a ditch. That was well done, I applauded him. Not in the least. As a last resort, it upped its tail and blew a filthy fart. Ugh! The smell of it. Since that time, whenever I see a weasel, I feel poorly. At this point, he raised a front paw and stroked his muzzle, muzzle two or three times as if he were still suffering from last year's stench. I felt rather sorry for him, and in an effort to cheer him up, said, But when it comes to rats, I expect you just pin them down with one hypnotic glare. I suppose that's because you're such a marvellous ratter, a cat well nourished by plenty of rats, that you're so splendidly fat and have such a good complexion. Though this speech was meant to be flatter, strangely enough, it had precisely the opposite effect. He looked distinctly cast down and replied with a heavy sigh. It's depressing, he said. When you come to think of it, however hard one slaves at catching rats, it's the whole wide world, there's no creature more brazen-faced than a human being. Every rat I catch, they confiscate, and they tote them off to the nearest police box. Since the coppers can't tell who caught the rats, he just pays up a penny to a tail to anyone that brings them in. My master, for instance, has already earned about half a crown purely through my efforts, but he's never yet stood me a decent meal. The plain fact is that humans, one and all, are merely thieves at art. Though Blackie, far from bright, one cannot fault him in his conclusion. He begins to look extremely angry, and the fur on his back stands up in bristles. Somewhat disturbed by Blackie's story and reactions, I made off some, made some vague excuse and went off home. But ever since then, I've been determined never to catch a rat. However, I did not take up Blackie's invitation to become his associate, prowling after dainties in other rodents. I prefer the cosy life, and it's certainly easier to sleep than to hunt for titbits. Living at a teacher's house, it seems that even a cat acquires a character of teacher's. I'd best watch out, lest one of these days I too become dyspeptic. Talking of teachers reminds me that my master seems to have recently realised his total incapacity as a painter of watercolours, for under the date of December the 1st, his diary contains the following passage. At today's gathering, I met for the first time a man who shall be nameless. He is said to have led a fast life. Indeed, he looks very much a man of this world. Since women like this type of person, it might be more appropriate to say that he has been forced to lead rather than that he has led a fast life. I hear his wife was originally a geisha. She, he is to be envied. For the most part, those who carpet rakes are those incapable of debauchery. Further, many of those who fancy themselves as rake hells are equally incapable of debauchery. Such folk are under no obligation to live fast lives, but do so of their own volition. So I, in the matter of watercolours, neither of us will ever make the grade. And yet this type of debauchee is calmly certain that he only, only he is truly a man of the world. If it is to be accepted that a man can become a man of the world by drinking sake in restaurants or by frequenting houses of assignation, then it would seem to follow that I could acquire a name as a painter of watercolours. The notion that my watercolour purchase will never be... will will be better if I don't actually paint them, it leads me to conclude that a boorish country bumpkin is in fact far superior to such foolish men of the world. His observations about men of the world strike me as somewhat unconvincing. In particular, his confession of envy in respect of that wife who'd worked as a geisha is pos positively imbecile and unworthy of a teacher. Nevertheless, his assessment of the value of his own watercolour painting is certainly just. Indeed, my master is a very good judge of his own character, but still manages to retain his vanity. Three days later, on December the 4th, 
He wrote this in his diary. Last night, I dreamt that someone picked up one of my watercolour paintings, which I, thinking it worthless, had tossed aside. This person in my dream put the painting in a splendid frame and hung it up on the transom. Staring at my work thus framed, I realised that I have suddenly become a true artist. I feel exceedingly pleased. I spend whole days just staring at my handiwork, happy in the conviction that the picture is a masterpiece. Dawn broke, and I woke up. And in the morning sunlight, it was obvious that the picture was still as pitiful an object as when I painted it. The master, even in his dreams, seems burdened with regrets about his watercolours. And men who accept the burdens of regret, whether in respect of watercolours or of anything else, are not the stuff that men of the world are made of. The day after my master dreamt about the picture, the aesthetics in the gold rim spectacles paid a call, of him, call upon him. He had not visited for some time. As soon as he was seated, he inquired, And how is the painting coming along? My master assumed a nonchalant air and answered, uh, Well, I took your advice, and I am now busily engaged in sketching. And I must say that when one sketches, one seems to apprehend those shapes of things, those delicate changes of colour, which hitherto had gone unnoticed. I take it that sketching has developed in the West to its present remarkable condition solely as the result of the emphasis which, historically, has always been there been placed on the essentially essentiality thereof, precisely as Andrea del Sarto once observed. Without even so much as alluding to the passage in his diary, he speaks approvingly of Andrea del Sarto. The esthete scratched his head and remarked with a laugh, Well, <laughs> actually, that bit about del Sarto was my own invention. What was that? My master still fails to grasp that he's been tricked into making a fool of himself. Why all that stuff about Andrea del Sarto, whom you so particularly admire? I made it all up. I never thought you'd take it seriously. He laughed and laughed, enraptured with the situation. I overheard their conversation from my place on the veranda, and I could not help wondering what sort of entry would appear in the diary for today. This esthete is the sort of man whose sole pleasure lies in bamboozling people by conversation consisting entirely of humbug. He seems not to have the thought of the effect of his twaddle on about Andrea del Sarto must have on my master's feelings. Sometimes I cook up a little nonsense and people take it seriously, which generates an aesthetic sensation of extreme comicality, which I find interesting. The other day I told a certain undergraduate that Nicholas Nickleby had advised Gibbon to cease using French for the writing of his masterpiece, The History of the French Revolution, and had indeed persuaded Gibbon to publish it in English. Now this undergraduate was a man of almost eidetic memory, and it was especially amusing to hear him repeating what I had told him word for word and in all seriousness to a debating session of the Japan Literature Society. And, you know, there were nearly a hundred in his audience, and all of them sat listening to his drivel with the greatest enthusiasm. In fact, I have another even better story. The other day, when I was in the company of some men of letters, one of them happened to mention Theophano Ainsworth's historical novel of the Crusades. I took the occasion to remark that it was quite an outstanding romantic monograph and added the comment that the account of the heroine's death was the epitome of spectacle. The man sitting opposite to me, one who has never uttered the three words, I don't know, promptly responded that those particular paragraphs were indeed especially fine writing, from which observation I became aware that he, no more than I, had ever read the book at all. Wide-eyed, my poor dyspeptic master asked him, uh, fair enough, but what would you do if the other party had in fact read the book? It appears that my master is not worried about the dishonesty of the deception, merely about the possibility, possible embarrassment of being caught out on a lie. The question leaves the esthete unutterly unfazed. Well, if that should happen, I'd say I'd mistaken the title or something like that. And again, quite unconcerned, he gave himself to laughter. Though Natalie tricked out in gold-rimmed spectacles, his nature is uncommonly akin to that of Rickshaw Blackie. My master said nothing but blew smoke rings as if in confession of his own lack of such audacity. The esthete, the glitter of whose eyes seemed to be answering, no wonder you being you could not even cope with watercolours, went on aloud, choking apart, uh, painting a picture is a difficult thing. Leonardo da Vinci is supposed to have once told his pupils to make a drawing of a stain on the cathedral wall. The words of a great teacher.
In a lavatory, for instance, if absorbedly one studies the pattern of the rain leaks on the wall, a staggering design and natural creation invariably emerges. You should keep your eyes open and try drawing from nature. I'm sure you could make something interesting. Is this another of your tricks? No, not this one. I promise. It's seriously meant. Indeed, I think that the image of the lavatory wall is really rather witty, don't you? Quite the sort of thing da Vinci would have said. Yes, it's certainly witty, my master somewhat reluctantly conceded. But I do not think he has so far made a drawing in a lavatory. Rachel Blackie has recently gone lame. His glossy fur has thinned and gradually grown dull. His eyes, which I once praised as more beautiful than amber, are now bleared with mucus. What I notice most is his loss of vita vitality and his sheer physical deterioration. When I last saw him in the tea garden and asked him how he was, the answer was depressingly precise. I've had enough of being farted at by weasels and crippled with sideswipes from the fishmonger's pole. The autumn leaves arranged in two or three scarlet terraces among the pine trees have fallen like ancient dreams. The red and white sasquanias near the garden's ornamental basin dropping their petals, now a white and now a red one, are finally left bare. The wintry sun along the ten-foot length of the southwards facing veranda goes down daily earlier than yesterday. Seldom a day goes by, but a cold wind blows. So my snoozes have been painfully curtailed. The master goes to school every day, and as soon as he returns, shuts himself up in the study. He tells all visitors that he's tired of being a teacher. He seldom paints. He stopped taking his takadea stasi, saying it does no good. The children, dear little things, now trot off day after day to kindergarten. But on their return, they sing songs, bounce balls, and sometimes hang me up by the tail. Since I do not receive any particularly nourishing food, I have not grown particularly fat. But I struggle on from day to day, keeping myself more or less fit, and so far, without getting crippled. I catch no rats. I still detest that Osan. And no one has yet named me, but since it's no use crying for the moon... I have resolved to remain for the rest of my life a nameless cat in the house of a teacher. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the first instalment of I Am A Cat. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> I'm not sure. Can you hear me? You can hear the cat, can't you? <laughs> could you hear the cat? I could hear myself. Did, did everybody hear the cat? Because I've just noticed that my microphone on this side is... Oh, that's my microphone on my, on my camera over there. That's all right. <laughs> ah. I didn't even pour myself a glass of wine. No, I've had a glass of wine. I need another glass of wine now after that. Hey, not that much. Hey, Robert. Hey, Cobrat. Uh, alas, I think possibly um, Chuck said she was going to watch. Might have, might have missed it. I don't know. Uh, oh, I'll, just, I'll just move the, get rid of the wobbly cat <laughs> for the moment. Yes, I mean, uh, I, I practiced a little bit. Um, got, uh, <clears throat> I basically, you know, went through a few, few uh, pages of that. So came across words that I'd not read before and... <laughs> Oh, yes, a well-deserved drink. Yes, I've got a quarter of an hour to fill now. I thought I thought the story would take longer than that. I calculated it like a, it was 56, 56 pages, and I'd calculated a minute a page. <laughs> so, and yes, I'd uh, misjudged the fact that I had to keep changing the pictures. Spent most of the time, actually, finding the pictures. Hang on, if I transfer back, oh, I've got to go here, yeah, and go to the wobbly cat. So this, this picture here, I mean, I've obviously photoshopped in the cat there. I photoshopped myself in there, you see? Very clever, isn't it? <laughs> uh, but the gentleman in the photograph is uh, the teacher, as played by a Japanese actor from a 1975 film uh, uh, based on the story. And uh, what other pictures do we have? I'll go through them. Let's go through them, and then you can you can see all the effort I went through. Here's the Osan, Japanese cleaning lady. This was meant to be the Shosei, 
with a look of terror on the cat's face. Um, this chap here is actually that's actually the author Soseki uh, as a student. I thought that appropriate. And then again, we have the shot of the uh, the actor from the 1975 film with the cat. And then this is supposed to be the actor who's locked, always locked up in his study. I didn't draw them this time. No, 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 no. no that would have taken too long. Um, and also, they're, they're photographs now uh, on the app, so they're much clearer. Um, what was the next one? That was that one. And then it was the, uh, the two children. And this is the, the white cat from next door that he's in love with. <laughs> and then this is the, uh, the teacher doing his painting, his watercolour painting. And then this is the tea garden. It's the nearest I could get to a tea garden where he meets uh, Rickshaw Blackie, who I uh, photoshopped <laughs> from a tortoiseshell and made him black. And then this is just a general gathering of, uh, this is supposed to represent the meeting of the people that the, the esthete was talking about, but actually it's a scene from the, the film. And then of course, the final one. The cat. Yes, if you if you do get a chance, read the book, um, and uh, it's it's quite entertaining. And oh, I'm talking cat here. <laughs> and uh, also, um, go and try and see that film. It's called. Uh, I mean, it's called I Am a Cat, um, by Kon Ichikawa from 1975. Uh, it's quite good. My actress friend has a very small part in it, playing the niece of the teacher. Back when she was one, of, it was one of her only second films that she'd ever made. Mm. So next week on the show, um, I have to announce that. Uh, well, Cobra knows this, that uh, the um, the Mod Squad, uh, Return of the Mod Squad, has been put back a little bit due to sort of family uh, commitments, uh, various of the Mod Squad members. So uh, we've shifted it back to uh, sometime in November, and we haven't really decided on the date yet. So what's happening next week? I don't know. That was originally going to be next week's show. Where did I get the idea to be a cat? Well, I thought it would be fun um, to... Uh, uh, this was an idea that I had for the original Mod, Mod Squad thing, and I didn't know how to do it to, to get th these sort of like avatar thingies uh so um i thought it would be fun to to have me on as a cat who would taken over the show um so uh I, I searched online and found uh this free uh like avatar creator thing on steam first i had to like download steam uh on the uh, which is a gaming thing uh, on the computer and from there i could then download uh the uh, the free version of this um it's fairly limited. You got only sort of like limited selection of avatars, but luckily they had a cat, um, and it does it automatically. Basically, to if I go here, it it looks like this. Animes free, <laughs> and I can it can do stuff, and I can I can move it up and down. I have to I have to go. Where do I have to go? I have to go to animes and then I can move it up and down. Beep, 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 beep. And I can turn it around. Ooh, 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 look, look at my back. I've got a bit of furry back. And uh used to be, I think it could do work. Does it do W W P A do? No. Some some things that it does. Hang on, what does it do? Uh, no, 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 gestures. That's it, gestures. Oh, all it does is this. <laughs> that's the only thing. In the free version, that's all it does. It's uh, animes, it's called, Robert. Oh, yeah, the, 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 the chap that got stuck as a cat avatar on Zoom in a, in a like proper business meeting. <laughs> uh, I can make his ears move. 
pull funny faces. I just stuck my tongue out at the audience. <laughs> but yes, this cat may appear in the future. I mean, it was all free, so um, but uh, there, there would have to be a reason for it. Perhaps follow on from the story. I don't know, but for the moment, uh, I think we've had enough of that. <laughs> Hang on, how do I get? How do I get here? I have to go back here. Where do I go? Oh, I go here. There we are. Got so many things going on. But yes, I move. My lips move. My, my ears move. <laughs> yes, I was. Uh, yeah, um, thought that would be a. Uh, you know, I don't think I could do that with any of the uh, sort of the more serious stories. <laughs> It seemed appropriate to use the cat for that. There's some some of the sort of more sort of um, darker Japanese uh, literary uh, outings, <laughs> as read by a demented cat. Yes, it's uh, it's uh, yes, it's face. It's from it's it's been developed from face rig. Yeah. And it's pretty good because it's sort of browser based, so uh, it doesn't use my my PC too much. So that was that. I'm afraid that uh, I think I remember in the, in the first in the, at least my microphone was working. I mean, my first attempt at Kamishi by uh, twelve minutes where. <laughs> <laughs> there was no microphone. So I'm going to sort of wrap up now. Um, and watch watch my replay and see it, if it was any, any any good. And I hope you enjoyed it. I hope, uh, Chuck, if you were watching, that you enjoyed that. And uh, your three cats and your mum enjoyed it as well. <laughs> and... Uh, Look forward to seeing you all again uh, next week sometime. I will be back to, possibly back to normal. I might try and do an out and about um, show. See how that goes. All depends on the weather. But then what, what, what are we the next week? 23rd, I think it is. 23rd. Yes, 23rd. Okay. Okay. So, uh, I shall say goodbye from it's goodbye from me. <laughs> and it's goodbye from me. I thank you for joining me on the show. And um I can't I can't twirl or, or do anything. I can shake my head around. <laughs> but uh, thank you for joining and uh, see you all again next week. Well, uh, you won't see me, uh, but you'll see him. Okay. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Bye for now. Time to go to sleep.